So welcome to part three of uh, how I think you can break into the wonderful world of media composition. Uh, part one was about how I did it in the past. Part two was how I thought you could do it today. And part three is the one I've been pondering for longest, which is about how you maintain your artistic direction and most of all, how you live to a ripe old age which often doesn't really go hand in hand with this job. A couple of you said the last one was a bit meandery, so um, I've actually prepared some notes for this one. Um, and a long coffee. I also apologise about my editing. Um, it reminds me of um, tightening drums. The minute you start, you can't stop. And it got a bit, bit too DeFranco on the last one. So basically the first question people ask me is what kit to get, which kind of sums up, I think, a lot of the reasons why a lot of us are in this profession. There's a lot of knobs with uh, LEDs, blue ones, we hope. Um, I guess this will also explain in many ways why I've set up this vlog away from Spitfire. Someone said to me, oh, you, you're kind of doing a Joey. And I said, well, I'm hoping it's gonna be more of a Frasier, to be honest. Kit, you need a com computer, you need a controller, you need something to hear it through either a pair of speakers or I would recommend a good pair of headphones. And then people go, well, what sounds? And I have to say, the next thing I would do if you're starting out and it's the last couple of hundred quid you've got to spend is for God's sake, don't buy commercial libraries. The next thing I would buy is a microphone and I would set about making my own sounds. The most important first step in your path to success is to find yourself and you're not gonna do that with other people's sounds. The real trailblazers, often utter a word, the same one, between them, even if they don't know each other, and that is the word tension. And you know how I go on about starve yourself of resources, become more resourceful? I also think introducing a degree of tension into your work is absolutely crucial. So Martin Ware, I went to Sheffield, 1970s, synth pop, where did that come from? And he went, well, I was a massive George Clinton fan, and, and all I could do is operate this computer, so that created a tension, and out that came. Um, I was talking to a composer who had a rule about um, he had to incorporate the last instrument he had bought into any score that he'd been given. I think he'd gone on holiday to Jamaica and he observed some people playing some steel pans and went, well, I'm a percussionist, well, I should get a few sets of those and have a little fiddle around with them, see if I can make some calypso music. And then the phone call went and a big film came in and it was a science fiction film and I have this wonderful image of him going, science fiction. I think I did a job a few years ago where I basically had carte blanche to be myself and I really had to ask myself, what is myself? Well, it's an amalgam of all of my experience. It's as uh, John Cage says, um, you know, when you walk into your studio at the beginning of the day, everyone you have walked and every experience you have had is in there with you. And slowly throughout the day, you remove each and every one of them. And hopefully by the end of the day, yourself. Um, I think I'm paraphrasing massively. Um, but I guess, you know, a lot of you are in college, are going to college. And, and another thing John Cage said is that, you know, the big mistake of college is having 200 people uh, all reading the same textbook, where surely 200 people should be reading 200 textbooks. And I think that that's, that's key. You know, you may have the same top 10 list of, of composers, but they're never going to be in the same order. And their works, you know, your favourite tracks by, I don't know, Prince, may not be Raspberry Beret like it is for me. So as a consequence, you know, your heritage is going to be unique so you must rely on that and I think I'm going back to uh, something that Dario Marianelli said to me which is you know you have to maintain a connection to your music and if you allow people to sever that when he says your music I think he means your heritage your history which you must you know it's like it's like a portfolio you must invest in that so things like show reels evidence that you have done maybe a student movie this that and the other you know I've mentioned this in previous ones, I'm not so sure. Be very, very careful about the work you take. And I would really try and say, you know, just never ever work for free. The thing I think that, that is important is to provide brilliant examples of brilliant work. I think back in my day, showreel was really important. It was really important that people could see that you could work to picture. I don't know so much, but I think something that is really important is to provide people uh, with as many good experiences of you as possible. In this day and age, with LinkedIn, with Facebook, people can get in touch with each other. So often I find these days, when I'm asked to do a job, 
um, often what I will find is a producer has gone, yeah, and I spoke to the so-and-so, did that so-and-so with you on the thing and said you did a really good job. So I think it's absolutely crucial that people are spreading a positive word of you. And I guess that extends to stuff like social media, stuff that I've been absolutely crap about. And the other thing to do, you know, when you do get your work or if you're assisting a composer, because I think the best way to learn is to, is to observe, is to really tune your superego so you remain right size. Superego, by the way, it's, it's not your ego as in, I've got a super ego, thanks. No, your super ego is the thing that controls your ego. It's the thing that looks outside yourself and goes, you're acting like a fool, stop doing that, or keeps you right-sized, keeps you boundaried. And I think knowing where you are in the pecking order is absolutely crucial. A number of times I've seen people screw up because they're saying the wrong things at the wrong time. When you've maybe got a few things under your belt and a director maybe seems a little bit inexperienced to you, the number of times I've written emails that are just shouldn't have written. I have a rule with uh, my wife and that is that if I have something I want to say to her that's negative I just wait 24 hours and 99% of the time I just don't say anything at all because I think what we often do is pre project our emotional reaction to something. Now a director is not interested in how your experience of this show or film that you're working on is making you feel. Collaboration is a creative negotiation and I think so often, it's like, well, I didn't say him I was fucked off. No, you didn't. But you said you weren't going to do that cue because you didn't think it was the right thing to do. And you just did that because he somehow injured your ego. So I would say, hold your feelings. Let the feelings ebb away so that you can then attack the creative negotiation in a pragmatic and productive way. Day jobs financing your career well I think assisting composers is absolutely great I would always say try whatever you do alongside composition to make it music so whether it be piano bars this that and the other but I feel the greatest restraint and danger to your career is enslaving yourself to overheads so whatever you do don't get a day job that's well paid don't take a flat that's got really high rent. Don't buy loads of equipment or take on loads of jobs so you have to pay assistants and orchestrators and all of that to help you uh, because it will restrict you more and more and constrict your ability to pick and choose, which is the most affluent thing for any creative is the ability to, to I guess, to be an artist. So if you're gonna take a day job, make sure it's scraping out refrigerators in Sainsbury's all hours. That's what Paul Thompson did. People have asked me about agents and I think uh, I have seen three different types of agents. I've seen agents who literally like, they're like kind of, they run lists of composers and they send composers to kind of cattle calls and that's great. Um, uh, I've seen uh, agents who don't really actively get you masses of work but are kind of uh, are well connected and at each different stage will help you, you know, maybe get the jobs, will do the negotiations. And I've seen agents who are real kind of like managers, who do real kind of life management, who who uh, will get you the ballets, who will get you the, the you know, the, the Izumiyaki shows as well as, uh, as films and stuff. Okay, I'm going to stop myself right there because uh, that last statement is a stratus spheric disservice to my wonderful agent Maggie and everyone that has worked with her. I'm also going to take us off this horrific freeze frame onto my B-cam. Basically I answered the question in the context of which it is usually asked, which is will I get more work, will I become a media composer if I get an agent? And I think that is a fundamental misunderstanding of what good agents do. So when you join an agency they're not necessarily going to open up the Ark of the Covenant for you and, and melt people's faces with your music. For example, uh, I got on a plane the other day and bumped into a guy who I used to work with, I hadn't seen for about 15 years, and he's a, a breakbeat artist who I would say, well, without being rude, he's, he's not a household name. He asked me what I'd been up to, and when I told him, he said, well, do you know, that's really funny you should say that, because I really want to be a film composer. In fact, I'd really like to do the music for the next Star Wars. Do you think I need an agent? Good agents basically create networks of people and what they do is they, they observe those networks and from the behaviour of those networks they then connect those people to yet more people, creating an infrastructure of like-minded, brilliant individuals. Now I've been introduced to some of my greatest collaborators and greatest friends and I just wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my agent. It's been a slow process and when the time is right she vouches for me with the right people. But if you're really lucky what an agent will do for you 
you won't realize they've even done until 20 years later. Now, there are two people other than my agent that if they hadn't been in my life, my life would be entirely different now. One is Anne Dudley, the other is Rupert Gregson Williams, both of which were introduced to me through my agent, something I have never thanked her for. I do think this is a massively important subject and one that I'm going to return to in a dedicated vlog soon because whilst the main players, you know, are perfectly legit, there's a lot of sharks out there and I think this community may be an opportunity to share our experiences and warn each other off. A quick headline point, agents should take between 10 and 15% off your fees. If they want to take 40, 50, 60%, kindly tell them to fuck off. The other thing that agents do from talking to other composers, which is pretty much universal, is they have helped me not walk off jobs and they have stopped me whenever they have got there in time from writing uh, career damaging emails. Yeah, I should have added to that 24 hours till you uh, speak to your wife thing is that I also, if I've had a glass of wine, you hold your feeling until the next morning. Um, people ask about library music. Well, I think it would be a disservice to you for me to offer an opinion on what the library scene is like now. Uh, my entire career's financial base is built on library. Uh, I did a bunch of stuff for KPM, which is now, I believe, EMI, uh, some of which was incredibly lucrative and helped to, to be this kind of seed funding for Spitfire. So yes, I think it's absolutely amazing. And yes, it's earning money doing great stuff, meeting great people. Um, so I think library is wonderful, but I don't really know what the, the lay of the land is now. I think that there are lots of library companies. And from what I've heard, maybe three of them, you know, have a massive market share. And you should, if you're not with them, it might not be worth it. If you do get a few tracks away on library, though, uh, just talking about going back to the idea of business planning, don't expect to see anything meaningful from them for at least three years. One little tip with library is don't be kind of creative with the names at all. Uh, just describe what the track is. I know someone who makes a huge uh, living out of library, and he says, by far, his biggest earner is a track called Low Deep Drone. I guess the other thing you may have noticed whilst talking to other composers, and this is something I'm trying not to be on this vlog, is, is a kind of curmudgeon. But there are a lot of people who don't seem to enjoy it. And it was extraordinary for me at the beginning of my career, meeting these composers, like, well, you're writing music to spaceships, and then it's in the cinema on the lights and the curtains and your name, and, it's you, and there's orchestras. We really are ruled by this idea of, you know, uh, uh, an ambition, an ambition we formed when we were five or six years old. I'm not going to repeat what I said earlier about all this, but, you know, there's so many of us wanted to be train drivers when we were younger. And I don't think I've met that many kind of particularly happy train drivers, to be honest. So don't be surprised if there are aspects to what you dreamt of doing that don't make you happy. The one thing I would suggest is, you know, make sure that you're really good at hitting reverse on your career. You know, a career trajectory is never like that. You want it to be like that and I think you know it's good to go into cul-de-sacs but it's good to understand when you can reverse out of them so for me one of the ambitions was you know I wanted to write the score to I don't know Blade Runner Ben but you know I've done some spaceshipy things and I did enjoy them but the stuff that made me that gave me the most joy was writing music for a Belgian 1930s detective series. Definitely the best job I've ever done. I think there's no harm in diversifying and indeed you know I work with a lot of people, even at Spitfire, who have gone into this profession and absolutely horrified by it. I think that you can expect to work long hours. I would query and question this thing of working a 17 hour day, seven days a week. I read this article about palliative nursing and they, they, they were unified in one opinion. And that was the single most uttered regret was from guys saying they wish they'd worked less. I don't think anyone on their deathbed goes, I wish I'd worked more. I question what your creative output is if you are working 17 hour days, seven days a week. Um, I became a dad and had to look after my kids at the weekend. And I thought, well, this is impossible because I work weekends, I work seven days a week. And lo and behold, I found my working week was you know, so much more productive. I think developing a confidence in your ability to deliver is absolutely crucial. And that's what gets me off work at six o'clock, knowing full well that I'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning the next day, and I will deliver something by 10 o'clock in the morning as requested. I think that's a, a real skill to hone. The ability to work fast, but the ability 
and the strategies to be confident that you're going to deliver something will mean that you don't work every hour God sends, which in turn, I think, uh, degrades your creative output. I think there's no harm in just pursuing stuff that you enjoy. And if you follow those steps of not enslaving yourself to outgoings, whether that be mortgages, big rents, or loads of assistance, or facility, or big whopping great fucking Neve desk that needs servicing, you should be able to make those choices. Um, I think a saying that I've had in the past where I've really got myself into a funk, you know, got, you know, had eight studios at one point and was just doing a load of crap that I hated doing. I wanted to have a saying on the wall for, for what summed up my life at that time, which was I took two of the greatest loves in my life, music and film, and turned them into a fucking job. I think the subject I'm skirting around, and I think probably for another film, which I can go into a lot of detail with, is the one thing to expect is that you will get fired. And I have a personal saying for that is, the further up you go, the more you get fired. The more you get fired, the further up you are, until the firing stops, at which point you're either at the top or the bottom. I guess what I'd like to end on is the absolute certainty that you face alongside death and taxes is that in the film world, you will meet narcissists. And narcissists don't like composers because composers rely on an internal heritage that narcissists can't control. And I think that until I start talking about what is an incredibly important subject for me, what I would recommend you do is you go to the Wikipedia page on Narcissistic Personality Disorder, known as NPD, and you print that out and you keep that somewhere safe because you will come up against it. One final word is just for God's sake, look after yourself. Uh, this, you are in it for the long haul. Um, and I've seen people, you know, just develop a Coke habit, but not like Coke cocaine, like Coca-Cola, just Red Bull and pizzas. And, you know, I've seen really amazingly fit and healthy nubile chaps go from that kind of Grecian look to, you know, studio zombies. And I really, really do worry about um, losing friends. You know, now at the age of 45 and stuff, you start looking at the previous generation and a lot of film composers who fell by the wayside. As someone said to me once, you know, we're not at war. This is fucking entertainment.